Hey class, um, I just wanted to kind of walk you guys through an example of what this paper sort of looks like uh, when you're done with it. Um, and I'm going to do that. We're going to go over this example paper, okay? You can find this. It's attached to this classroom assignment. Um, but I'm just going to go point by point through the comments. So this first one is the title. You need a title. Um, I like the format of some kind of quip and then an indication of what the paper's about. So this is a paper about Proctor and public martyrdom. Um, then you have the introduction. John Proctor is the protagonist in Arthur Miller's drama about witchcraft in Salem, The Crucible. He's a well-regarded man in the community who commits adultery and is found guilty of witchcraft. Now, just a couple notes. Um, this first line, it could be better. Um, this is called a hook. You might have remembered that. It's this is the line you have to capture an audience's attention. So like if you make it honestly, I'm not thrilled with this one, but it's fine. Um it introduces it. It does what it needs to do bare minimum, but sometimes you like to start with a joke. This line, however, must must be that nuanced thesis. Your thesis goes in the last part like the last sentence of your introduction. Throughout the play, he, Proctor, is strongly conflicted between the desire to act upon self-interest and the desire to be a moral man. This contrast encompasses Miller's message that one must search within oneself to do what is right and not what is expedient. Now, that's a thesis, that's a nuanced theme, because it, like, for this essay, because here... It addresses the prompt. By the way, your thesis is your like one sentence answer to the prompt. So to answer this prompt, your thesis needs to describe or like say specifically what the, your character's conflicted motivation is. It should talk about how Miller uses that. And then three, it should talk about the theme of the book that Miller connects to. This must be clear in order to meet the 10th grade standard for writing an argument. So this must be clear to get an A. Now let's go to the first sentence, the next paragraph. Every one of your body paragraphs should start with your topic sentence. So this is that PCEA format, um, point, context, and evidence, and then analysis, usually some kind of concluding sentence. So like a link, link to the next paragraph, link to whatever. The first sentence in each paragraph should tell you, or the first or second if you have a transition. But the first sentence in each paragraph, as a rule of thumb, should tell you what that paragraph is going to be about. Your first sentence tells the reader what the main idea of the paragraph is, and then every other sentence relates back to that main idea. Proctor's contradictory motivation to, fulfill his, to both fulfill his desires and his need to be a moral man with integrity demonstrates his complexity. Now, notice how here I transition or this, sorry, not me. I like edited this a little bit, but this is a student's essay. When Abigail, uh, this next line combines the student's own writing with the evidence. When Abigail tries to seduce Proctor in Act One, he admits to her, Abby, I may think of you softly time to time. And then you have the citation. It's actually pretty simple to do the citations. You don't even need a comma. It's just author's last name and page number. So that's why you wrote the page numbers down when you on your pre-writing document. Here, the word softly is reminiscent of regret that he had to end the affair. However, to save Elizabeth, Proctor confesses to the general court. You can either, so again, notice here how I linked this evidence, or excuse me, the students, or, ugh, notice how the student linked their own writing to this evidence. I promise you a student wrote this. Um, his condemnation of this same lust, synonymous with one of the deadly sins, is a condemnation of his own selfish desires. Rather than abiding by his mortals, he thought selfishly of the short term and broke one of the Ten Commandments. This contradiction between his actions and his integrity is also evident when he tries to confess to witchcraft in order to save his life. So notice here, this is where the student pointed out like a, contra a contradiction, and then they connected that to another part of the book. He tells Judge Hathorne, mere minutes before his hanging, I want my life. I will have my life. To accomplish this, when asked if he bound himself to the devil's services, he answers, I did. 
one of the Ten Commandments is that sh- thou shalt not fall fair, thou shalt not bear false witness. And confessing in court to something that is a lie is in direct violation of this. This reflects the same paradox that Hale attempts to resolve in Act Four by getting good Christians to lie. Proctor's intrinsic motivation is to remain honest, but his extrinsic motivation is to return to his wife. His contradictory and multifaceted motivations make him a complex character. Now, I just want to like, there, there's a lot of quotes in this student's writing, and that was kind of their style. Um, you should have at minimum two specific and relevant quotes from the text in each paragraph. This requires going through your annotations carefully, but if you were engaged while reading, it's possible to do what this student did, which is thread quotes together with your own writing to create a new analysis and connect the ideas that way. These words are bolded. Uh, This sentence, by the way, is a more complex restatement of the topic sentence. That Proctor is actually a complex character, which is the claim this paragraph was making, right? This demonstrates his complexity. Uh, I bolded these words to remind you that you should use the words in the 2.0 row of the proficiency scale. Okay? Remember, intrinsic just means inner motivation. Extrinsic means outer motivation. And you can't, you must use the words motivation and complex character at a bare minimum because you can't talk about either without using the words. Throughout the play, Proctor's figurative language in the dialogue also symbolizes the desire to act for more uh, moral reasons. So notice, second paragraph is talking about a symbol and how like his language symbolizes stuff. When he ceases to commit lechery with Abigail, he realizes his relationship with her was immoral and despicable. He tells her forcibly, Abby, I may think of you softly from time to time, but I will cut off my hand before I reach for you again. Wipe it out of mine. Now, check this out. What if we do this? And we start the quote here. I will cut off my hand before I reach for you again. Wipe it out of mind. The reason I'm doing that is because this, or the reason I'm making that change is because this student had a bunch of that quote that you didn't actually need, right? If you only use the part of the quotes that you need, then it gives you more room for your analysis and it forces you to talk specifically like this student did about the cut off my hand. This willingness to dismember himself seems like hyperbole. However, the deadly consequences of his actions demand confession. The pain of his hypocrisy becomes greater than the pain of honesty. He is tired of the lies he has told and the sins he has committed. Proctor does not want to lie anymore. Notice how, whoop, it says I again. The student, uh, there's no like, I think, I feel, etc. Um the academic voice is authoritative, but you can use qualifiers, right? Um, words like however are good to show the reader that you're like contrasting. Um, then basically a lot of these sentences say they repeat the same kind of thing in a slightly different way. And it's going from specific to more general. He sternly asked Deputy Governor Danforth, I blacked all of them. And you can, if you need, in quotes, insert your own words in brackets. Try not to do it a lot. When this confession is nailed to the church the very day they hang for silence. With this said, he proceeds to rip up the document, securing his hanging. This document represents the social contract of Salem, and Proctor's honesty exposes its corruption. The liars live, and honest Christians. Whoops. As you read it, you'll catch other typos too. Honest Christians die in a society that asserts its holiness. It is only after it is torn that Proctor can recognize his own integrity. Notice that colon to quote to connect quotes again. For now, I do think I see a shred of goodness in John Proctor, not enough to weave a banner with, but enough to keep it from such dogs. This final valiant contrast between himself, flawed as he is, and the society, characterized as less than human dogs, shows that Proctor truly does care about morals and is willing to pay the ultimate price for him. So again, notice the pattern in this uh, in this paragraph. It's like quote. Analysis that connects it to the next thought, which is supported by a quote, that analysis that connects a previous thought to a new idea, like, that's a good strategy to do this. And if you want to go back to your connotation analysis um, sheet, which I linked in, I'll link in this assignment, um, go for it. 
After being conflicted throughout the play with regards to whether or not to act upon self-interest or morality, Proctor made his final decision in the waning moments of the play. He chose mortality, or morality, and finds goodness within himself. When asked to attempt to persuade her husband to lie and confess to witchcraft in order to save his life, Elizabeth Proctor re responded with a cry, He have his goodness now. God forbid I take it away from him. This powerful line reinforces the theme that Miller is attempting to leave readers with, that one must do what is right and not what is expedient. Proctor's sin is that he believed he could escape the consequences of his actions. Of course, God forbids Elizabeth from saving Proctor. Or, of course God forbids Elizabeth from saving Proctor. Sometimes sentences like that can be really good for, like, emphasis. Um, you can try to return to an earlier quote and see what else it might connect to, just like this student did. His earlier cowardice hastened the downfall of society. Proctor's courageous honesty leads to the postscript resolution and echoes down the corridor. Proctor pays the price for his sins, but because of his sacrifice, Salem is saved. This mirrors the story of Christ's sacrifice. Oh, interesting. So that's that's kind of left out there. You might want to make that a more part, or the student might want to make that a more central part of the paragraph, but it works. When we engage in courageous leaps of faith, anyone, even those as sinful and miserable as John Proctor, can redeem the goodness within themselves. While that sacrifice opens the gateway to redemption, one must remember Proctor's final words in Act 2. We are what we always were, only naked now. Whoops, looks like that student forgot a, uh, yeah, they forgot a page number. The public nature of his confession is not what destroyed Salem. If Salem represents the world and Proctor is our martyr, then we learn that it is our human pride to believe that we can live in disharmony with our beliefs. Proctor's Christ-like martyrdom makes courage honesty, or courageous honesty, in spite of the consequences, shows a path to goodness and a goal we can strive toward. Okay, another good strategy for a conclusion is to basically, now that you've demonstrated your thesis is true, or if there's like other symbols you want to say, you can use if, if this is true, then this also follows. And that's a good way to like connect the stuff you've been talking about with something else. And here's the last part, right? This one's pretty important. At the end, just look at your essay. Does it look like an essay? And what I mean by that is like, look at this here. Okay. Um, let's just zoom in a little. So we can get a good look at this. Does it look like it has paragraphs? Does it look like an academic essay? Right? Does it does it look like something you'd be proud of turning in? Um, or does it look like something that you wrote in 15 minutes but like didn't even read and then hit turn in? Okay. Um, I want the reason I'm asking is because revision is where real writing happens. OK, um, it's where you look at your draft and you do the things I just showed you to do. Revi like drafting is just putting the ideas you've already written in order. But revising is where you really like make the connections that create your argument. OK, that student. All right. Maybe it was me. It's fine. But like that essay, um, I promise you, I had to go back through and like change some stuff because it doesn't fit. And even as I was reading it to you, there's still other stuff that I would change if I, you know, wasn't doing this in one take. So, like, revision is really where the most powerful, where the most effective writing happens. Um, and you guys should revise for the things that are on the proficiency scale. Okay? You should revise for in the 3.0 row. Make sure that you can check all of those checkboxes next to the 3.0 row. All right, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at that first when I'm grading. And if you do some of them, but not all of them, then you can, you max out at a B. If you do none of them, then I start to just check off the ones in the 2.0 row. If you do all of those, you get a C. If you do some of them, then you get a D, because that means there's major omissions in the grade level standard, and you didn't have demonstrate all the prerequisite skills. This paper is worth a substantial grade and you cannot pass the class without attempting it okay um please make sure now that you know that please make sure to make an appointment for friday so we can talk all right guys i will see you in a bit have fun
you should use the rest of this class time to revise.